Good evening uh, to everybody and thank you for coming. Uh, today we have a special guest at the Center for Women's Studies, Titi Bhattacharya, Professor of South Asian History and the Director of Global Studies at Purdue Uni University. She's a prominent Marxist feminist and a theorist of socially, social reproduction, one of the national organizers of the International Women's Strike in 1917 and a long-time activist for Palestinian justice. This is also co-author of the feminist, Feminism for 99%, a manifesto, and a Croatian translation of this important book you have here today, and you may take your own copy of the book after the lecture. We don't have many opportunities to talk on uh, gender and sexual violence in capitalism from the Marxist perspective, so uh, let's hear about it. Titi, the floor, the floor is yours. Okay, great. Um, so thank you all for um, coming and thank you, Carolina, for inviting me to this wonderful space. I wish there were more women's centers all over the world uh, run by such radical uh, group of uh, women, both um, intergenerationally. So it's, it's a real privilege to be here. So I want to talk about uh, gender violence, but I want to talk in two parts. One is I want to think about um, the larger framework in which we place gender violence, right? Because gender violence is experienced as an interpersonal violence, okay? Someone has to be violent to someone. Um, and that is, in a sense, uh, theory is, in a sense, inadequate to understanding personal motivations. Where critical theory is important, <laughs> for us as an explanatory tool is to understand the conditions that produce violence, okay? What are the conditions of possibility for violence? Not whether, you know, John's gonna hit Miriam. That is not critical the theory's domain, but what are the conditions of possibility that allow John to hit M Miriam? And there we can make certain um, deductions about what kind of social circumstances um, are, are more conducive to the possibility of production of violence ra uh, rather than uh, others. So let us begin with an image. A naked white man pursuing a low-wage black female asylum seeker down the corridors of an expensive New York hotel in order to force her to have sex with him. The man was the then director of the International Monetary Fund, uh, the IMF, and uh, he was French politi politician, Dominique Strauss-Kahn, and the woman was, uh, that we're talking about here, is 33-year-old Nafisatu Diallo. She was a housekeeper at this, um, at this hotel, and, uh, you know, had, had gone into Strauss-Kahn's uh, room to, to clean, clean um, uh, his, his room. At that time, she was a migrant worker at, in New York, and she was seeking asylum in the United States from her uh, native um, Guinea, a former colony, of course, of France. Uh, all criminal charges of rape and assault were dropped against the IMF chief. Um, he had to pay a little price that included, amongst other things, his resignation and a settlement to Ms. Diallo. But can we then say that justice was served? This answer should be of interest to all revolutionary Marxists. This is because I think a, a map, a cartography of dispossession extends between these two figures, okay? The, the head of the IMF, Dominic Strauss-Kahn, and Nafisatu Diallo. And it is the purpose here for us to explore that map, that cartography, and see what is it that allows this, uh, this kind of events not to be just individual events, but become a serial, um, uh, con uh, serial events from this particular class and race, race of men. That image of, I mean, can you imagine, I mean, just think about that image, a naked white man pursuing this black woman migrant worker down the corridors of this very, very fancy um, American hotel. That image really ought to be considered an icon for our times. It is iconic in the sense that it captures a moment when the distinction between the individual and the social vanishes, and the individuals 
which is the naked wealthy white man and the black low-aged woman, emerge as pure embodiments of the social. They are no longer at that point as individuals. They are sort of almost representing a social map here of, um, uh, of, of uh, existing um, social relations. Needless to say, the representative power of the image of Strauss-Kahn assaulting Diallo lies in the actual power. This is not just a question of symbol. The actual power that international financial institutions, such as the IMF, have over countries of the global south, such as Guinea, where Diallo comes from. From the 1980s onwards, um, you know, uh, we have or you know, late 1970s, we've had the establishment of neoliberal policies in this part of the globe, mostly at the behest of institutions such as the World Bank, right? So the people like Strauss-Kahn has actually had a direct role to play in the impoverization of women like Nafisatu de Allo. So the, the institutions of the IMF have something to do with how she ended up as a migrant worker in, in the United States. So I think uh, one of the ways that we need to understand is what neoliberalism actually did in this period, in the last 40 years, in order to understand why we've seen an escalation of violence um, not just escalation of violence in these sort of assaults, but an escalation of legislations that um, condone and advocate violence, for instance, attack on reproductive rights of women, uh, the um, legitimization of rape as a rhetoric. Okay, so there are several US senators that have gone on record that, you know, um, rape is God's way of uh, impregnating some certain kinds of women because, you know, they're not <laughs> ready to be impregnated yet. So the, these are elected officials who are going on national TV saying, saying these sort of things. So what do we, um, how does Marxism help us understand this relationship between the rise of violence in the neoliberal era and uh, Marx's theory? So uh, a couple of points, and I want to um, outline three essential ways in which we can, um, we can use Marx's theory to understand this. The first is that the last four decades of neoliberalism have created a marked escalation in gender crimes in most countries. The financial crisis of 2008 exacerbated what was already a serious problem. So this is no longer a, a, a situation of business as usual, and it requires socialists and feminists to critically engage with the problem. Uh, and we also need to explain it. So the central idea that I want to explore is that capitalism faced with a crisis is seeking a resolution to its crisis, okay, uh, in two connected ways. One is through an attempt to restructure production as manifest in the drive for austerity, okay? Austerity is capitalism's solution to, um, to get out of the crisis uh, by restructuring production. But also the second, and this is where we want to also focus, is by trying to reorder social reproduction um, as evidenced in its efforts to recraft gender identities and recirculate certain ideologies regarding the working class family. Okay, let's start with that proposition and then we can uh, go into how, how that happens. But one thing to remember is that it is a simultaneity. This restructuring of a production and the restructuring of social reproduction is a simultaneous process that um, um, uh, and united in capitalist restructuring. And this is where um, I think uh, social reproduction theory as a theory is helpful in us understanding um, uh, understanding the rise of, of gender uh, violence, okay? So let's first, before we go into, let's get two things out of the way. One is what is social reproduction theory? And the second is um, what is the scale of gender violence that we're talking about, okay? So a lot of you in this room, uh, because you've been trained by people like uh, Carolina and Ankita already know about social reproduction theory, so I'm just gonna 
talk briefly about it, but we can discuss it later in the Q&A perhaps. So social reproduction theory is um, an idea that is developed by Marxist feminists from uh, taking their lead from Capital Volume 1. Okay? And the central idea is that um, capitalism as a system of commodity production is uh, structured by uh, or driven by the production of commodities and the production of surplus value by workers. Okay? So that is the central driving force of the system as a whole. Commodities must be produced, surplus value must be produced, and it goes back and back into this recycled mode. Uh, social reproduction feminists, uh, Marxist feminists, then ask a further question that if workers produce commodities under capitalism, who produces the worker? So it is the worker's labor power that is harnessed in order to produce the commodities. And it is the surplus value that is extracted because labor power creates more value. That's what keeps the system going. But how is labor power reproduced, right? So those of you who have jobs, how many of you have jobs in this room? OK, quite a few people, OK? So um, many of you love your jobs, but many of you probably hate your job, OK? And most of us hate our jobs in a good day or a bad day, right? So even if, in general, it's a good job, we hate it. So we come home from work, and things are really rubbish, and it's, you're, you're tired. So how is it possible that you go back the next day? OK, your batteries just run out. So what are the ways in which you go back to work the next day? What do you need? Rest. You need rest. So you need, so think about rest. Let's unpack rest, right? For rest, what you need is you need a shelter, right? So it wouldn't be good to rest on the streets. So you need shelter. Uh, you need uh, a bed, perhaps. You need uh, to make the bed. And before rest, you need to eat some food. And again, let's unpack food, because often uh, men will say, oh, you need food. But for women, most of us know that food is not just food. Food is a series of tasks, right? So the shopping, the bloody chopping, and the cooking, and then blah, blah. So food is, again, a whole list of tasks, OK? And then there is psychical care. Right, but you have you go into work, uh, you come home, you've had a rubbish day at work. Yes, there's food and shelter or whatever, but you do need someone to tell you it was not your fault. Okay, so there's some emotional labor that goes in. It wasn't your fault that the boss was being such a pig to you, right? It wasn't. It, it's okay. So all of these resources are necessary for you to go back to uh, to go back to work the next day. OK, so these are various steps in which your labor power is regenerated, as it were, such that the boss can have it again the next day, right? Now, all of these tasks are performed at home free of cost, OK, so that the boss can have the labor power again. So, but think about it. So social reproduction, then, is the reproduction of your labor power in this domestic unit that we call the family. Okay, the kin-based unit that we call the family. But is that only place where your labor power is reproduced? Because think of the work that you do. Okay, whatever the work is, you had to have some training for it. Okay, which means you had to have had some schooling. Okay, elementary schooling, comprehensive schooling, whatever. Some of us have gone to college, okay, in order to get the jobs that we do. So these are also institutions which shape your labor power, okay? So public schools, public hospitals are institutions that help you uh, in order to maintain your labor power. If you are hurt or whatever, a public hospital will help you. Public transport systems get you to work. So all of these institutions are we are talking about not just the family, that are essential to the reproduction of your labor power. Now, I want you to imagine a scenario, because you're thinking, OK, where is this going with gender violence? I want you to imagine a scenario as we talk through these institutions. What would happen to a society and a community, a working class community, if you take away all these social provisionings? Okay, think about a community darkened 
by the absence of all of these, that all your public hospitals are uh, privatized, all your public parks are privatized, all your schools are privatized, your rent is astronomical, so you're thrown out of your housing, OK, because you can't afford it anymore. The food subsidies have been taken away, so food is unaffordable, OK? so we're Again, think about all the little ingredients that go into reproduction of labor power, and then think about a society where you take the ingredients away. Okay, So that's where we come back to the story of why uh, social reproduction theory kind of um, sort of helps us make, make sense uh, of it. So uh, as we uh, said, um, what are the fundamental uh, components of social provisioning or social reproduction for the vast majority of people? Food and shelter, as we said, are two basic requisites for social reproduction to take place. And following from these, other socialized services uh, such uh, for maintaining human life and dignity, such as healthcare, education, childcare, pensions, public transport, shelter, so let's take shelter, we start with, OK? Uh, just like the family, operate at two opposing registers under capitalism. On the one hand, the home appears as, the, as a safer place to most of us as compared to the violence and uncertainty of the public world, OK? So things get rub bad in the outside world. We see home as a refuge. Real human relations of love and cooperation can flourish within the four walls of a home, um, captured fleetingly uh, in a child's laughter or a kiss shared between a couple. But as many of us also know, and especially a, a, a meeting like this of feminists, that uh, the home is also, because it's private, is also shielded from all public scrutiny. And it can be a theater of absolute personal violence and shameful secrets. We know that as well, right? So the home functions uh, in this double manner. Anyone who has witnessed a woman trying to hide discolored bruises or, um, or seen a child just shutting up in the presence of a loving uncle knows the extent of such horrors. However, um, the, the home uh, nevertheless serves as a shelter in a cruder and more material sense. It is literally the physical shelter that allows the worker to rest before the next day's labor. Okay, so this is something that we want to talk about as, as home. It is no surprise then in the post 2008 world in the global north. Okay, so after the financial crash of 2008, a significant contributor to the rise in intimate per partner violence has been the financial stress associated with mortgage areas and foreclosures. Okay, in all places where you have seen um, the sort of housing crash uh, that, that led to the financial crash, et cetera, you have seen in these countries an absolute escalation in intimate partner violence. Okay, so um, this is. Um, in, in the United States, data from the Census and National Survey of Families and Households have conclusively proven women in general and African-American women in particular as most at risk being victims of both predatory loans, which, uh, you know, housing loans that, that led to the crash, as well as from the domestic violence resulting from foreclosures and evictions, okay? So this is a report not written by a Marxist. This is a report from the National Resource Center on Domestic Violence, and th I'm just going to quote from this report because, again, it's not written by a Marxist. It's just by someone who's observing these, um, these conditions. Women who leave their abusive partners often stay with family members or friends. If family members and friends cannot house them, they may go to domestic violence or homeless shelters. Research shows that nearly one-fifth of domestic violence survivors combine informal and formal sources of housing assistance when they leave abusive partners. But this same research also shows that more than a third 
third of domestic violence survivors report being homeless as a result of trying to end abusive relationships. This percentage may rise because of the current economic downturn. Unfortunately, the already strained budgets of service providers, including domestic violence and homeless shelters, are being cut at the same time that they're facing greater needs. Okay, so again, this is austerity cutting domestic violence shelters, closing them down, which, uh, and then the foreclosure issue raising the question of homelessness, rents being very high. So women have two choices either to become homeless or to stay in the abusive relationship because they need a roof over their head. Okay, so this is a rising uh, crisis after the of, of homelessness, and, and and just to just to say something that the state's solution to domestic violence has always been so the government solution is uh, always to escalate not the social provisioning functions of the state but to escalate the carceral functions of the state, okay? So domestic violence shelters are, um, in the United States anyway, I, I don't know about uh, elsewhere, domestic violence shelters um, are given funding on the, um, on the condition, that there's always this, uh, when you ask for grants from the government, I used to work in a domestic violence sh shelter for over uh, uh, 12 years. And whenever we wrote grants to, uh, to apply for funds to the government, we were told that we have to, um, we have to include the number of times we have approached the police in order to report the abuser, okay? So you have to constantly uh, link the, so when you take a report, you know, you, when you do intake, right? I, I don't know, those of you who've done, worked in shelters, you have to do intake for the person who's coming to seek the shelter. And the, the, law, and the uh, demand of the government is when you do intake, you get as much information as possible from the woman and you report that to the police, okay? Irrespective of what the woman is wanting because they're using government resources. If you use government resources, then these are the conditions that you have to do, which again, does not solve the problem of either homelessness or the lack of resources to the woman, but it increases the carceral functions of the state rather than the social provisioning functions of the, of, of the state. There are numerous stories documenting this overlap between the 20, uh, 2008 uh, housing meltdown and, and domestic violence. For example, there is the 2008 suicide of an older husband and wife in Oregon in the United States that followed their home foreclosure. In Los Angeles, California, an unemployed man who once worked for Price, uh, Pricewaterhouse um, uh, murdered his wife, three sons, and his mother-in-law before turning the gun on himself. He left a suicide note saying that he had been financially ruined and had considered suicide, but decided in the end to kill his entire family as it was more honorable. Okay, so let us archive away the significance of using the word honorable here and uh, we'll have cause to return to it later. Next, let, let us look at some other provisions, right? So we talked about the ingredients that recreate labor power. So we looked at shelter. So what happens when you take away shelter? Let's look at food, water, and some other products that make up household economies that embody women's labor and responsibility. In this context, um, it is important to remember that women have often produced goods of use value within the home. For women in, um, so this is, um, uh, the anhyl, so subsistent economies uh, have often uh, been uh, something that women have participated uh, in uh, throughout the period of capitalist uh, accumulation. Okay, in the global south, the annihilation of the subsistence economy and women's full integration into the market came much later and at the behest of neoliberal policies. In several parts of West Africa, for instance, structural adjustment programs have forced governments to cut financial aid to public water companies. So this was the way that 
the IMF forced uh, countries of the global south to balance their budget, okay? That, you know, the reason you're failing is because you're spending too much money on social provisions, right? There's, you're spending too much money for, on food and shelter and water and all this nonsense stuff, okay? So just cut those things and just do export goods, okay? So this was uh, the IMF's um, uh, dictum. So remember, again, think, keep that image in your head of the IMF chief pursuing the, the migrant worker. So um, uh, in West Africa, um, the, the IMF uh, have forced governments to cut financial aid to public water companies. And yet water, the essential ingredient to cooking, cleaning, and care work is, and has been for a long time, uh, primarily a woman's responsibility. So in locations where the government does not provide water due to cuts, you still need water. So women have to still get water, right? Just because the government has stopped providing it doesn't mean that families have stopped needing water, right? So um, in rural Senegal, for instance, women will walk up to 10 kilometers, which is uh, six point, about over six miles, to fetch water for the family. This picture is even starker in the case of food. One of the major demands of the IMF on southern economies was that they devalue their currency. The goal of devaluation was to raise the price of imported goods and thereby reduce the consumption of these goods. Of course, food, fuel, and medicines form the bulk of imported goods for southern, uh, countries of the uh, south, right? global south. So, Two kind of processes then take place in the home under capitalism. On the one hand, it continues to be the caring, non-instrumental space in an increasingly commercialized and hostile world. On the other hand, it is also the site of highly gendered expectations, where at the end of a tyrannical shift at work, one anticipates a hot meal and a bed both made by women. This contradiction is true for nearly all periods of capitalism history, but in the last four decades under neoliberalism, the home was hollowed out of all subsistence resources. There remains no vegetable garden in the back, no common lands to gather firewood, and the lone rice mill in the yard was sold in order to pay for packaged rice from Texas. Yet. The need for material provisioning for the human laboring body within the home remains, laced with the ideological expectation that women ought to be providing for such a need in the form of food, water, and care. So the real material need for food and shelter combined with the highly ideological expectation that women are responsible for meeting that need within the home provide the conditions of possibility for gendered violence, okay? So on the one hand, you have this transference, this abdication by the state of all social provisioning responsibilities. The state no longer takes any responsibility for providing ca social care in any sense, but the need for care doesn't uh, disappear, nor does the gendered expectation of who provides care disappear. So those are the conditions of possibility for gendered violence within the home. So in order to understand why John hits Miriam, you have to understand this wider context which makes it possible for John to hit Miriam, right? So we cannot just start with John hitting Miriam. We have to understand in what circumstances it is more possible for John to hit Miriam than others, okay? So that's um, kind of uh, sort of the, the context um, in which we have to understand the financial crisis and the sort of uh, the rise in um, uh, uh, the attacks on social provisioning. Neoliberal restructuring of global capitalism from the 1970s uh, played a specific part in this story of social reproduction in general. It is important to understand that neoliberal policies were so effective in the sphere of production and trade because they simultaneously eliminated the supports that underwrote the work of social reproduction. From healthcare and education to community services and public transit, the public infrastructure was rapidly stripped in a manner similar to how in many parts of the world, the land was stripped for the new emerging extractive industries. How did this help capital? 
The elimination of public support for social reproduction did not mean that workers were then excused from being workers in the sphere of production. Okay? Just because the worker does not have you know, hospitals or a home or whatever doesn't mean they can, she can stop going to work. Indeed, this simply meant that all support that was previously public was either transferred onto individual families or privatized and priced out of reach for the vast majority. Public parks, whose infrastructure was built with public money, got injected with fresh cash from corporations and closed their gates to working class children. There were still pools, after school programs, and decent health care, but only for those who could afford them. Uh, this made all workers, male and female, vulnerable in the workplace and less able to resist uh, the assault. When the neoliberal um, era faced its crowning meltdown in the global financial crisis of 2008, social reproduction for the global working class was already under severe strain. Okay? The infrastructure was already uh, creaky. It is now well documented that the financial crisis caused a rise in gendered violence. Okay, so I can give you some uh, figures. In the UK, domestic violence rose 35% in 2010. Okay, in Ireland in 2008, there was a 21% rise. Um, and um, the number rose even further in 2009. Um, up 43% from the 2007 figures. In the United States, 80% in, in 2011, 80% of shelters nationwide reported an increase in domestic violence cases for the third year in a row. And 73% of these cases were attributed to financial issues, including job loss. Okay? So um, this is. Uh, Indeed, social scientists have regularly used the research metrics of the 1930s Great Depression in the West to understand the domestic relations of subsequent economic crises. How does this picture of escalated violence fit our social reproduction framework? Unable to meet their family's needs within the home, women were often literally forced from the home to forage in the streets. Okay. A World Bank survey of civil society organizations found that during the economic crisis, poor people resorted to, and I'm quoting, increased participation of women and children in subsistent activities like cardboard collection on the streets. The fin financial crisis did not just add to the burden of reproduction, but wide-scale job losses and wage cutting by bosses meant that women were either forced to take on more than one paid job or accept worse conditions in their current jobs. But even when women worked even longer hours and became the chief breadwinner in the family, women's labor in the public sphere continued to carry the stamp of informal unwaged work that she performs in the private sphere. Consider the case of the United States, where 65 million jobs were created during the era of neoliberal structuring, and women filled 60% of these jobs between 64 and 97. But what kind of jobs were these? Okay, uh, the jobs were mostly low wage, lower tier service sector jobs, okay, uh, providing the bulk of workers in both the um, fastest and largest areas of low wage uh, growth. Because the informal sector, um, the so called informal sector, is often unregulated and free from labor laws, uh, the info this, this sector in various parts of the world often um, uh, work like housework within uh, the, the um, private sphere in the sense that it's unending and can function beyond what is considered to be acceptable business hours within that society. Two recent cases of violent rape in neoliberal India reveal the connecting tissues between neoliberal policies and the assault on women. So um, in India, um, women. Uh, one of the you know sort of majoritarian Hindu nationalist discourse on uh, women being raped was that um, they, they were out late at night okay and this because they were out late at night uh, this argument goes made them deserve their violent fate uh, 
In court, a defense attorney for uh, three of the five men accused in the case of a woman raped and killed in Delhi in 2012. Many of you may have heard of that case. They were massive um, anti uh, um, rape and sexual violence protests in, in Delhi during, uh, during that time, 2012. I was in Delhi at the time, December of 2012. The scenes in the street were amazing. You know, young women by their thousands hitting the street. But um, the lawyer who defended uh, the rapist, uh, and that's a very interesting story as well, because all the rapists were working class uh, men. So um, the lawyer who uh, defended the rapist said, and I quote, I have not seen a single incident or example of rape with a respected lady. So obviously, you know, respected ladies don't get raped. So this one was not respectable. So she got raped um, uh, because she was uh, out late at night with a male friend. OK. Um, both the victims of this, these two much publicized rape cases in Delhi, the woman killed in December 2012 and the woman attacked in Dhalakwa, which is another um, 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 very public, much publicized rape case, both of them worked for, take a guess, Western call centers. Okay, So they worked at call centers. So India is nearly 12 hours ahead of the West, right? So if you're working for a Western call center, then what is, the, what is your usual working hour at this call center? The middle of the night, because that's when Canadians and Americans wake up, OK? So all these women worked in these call centers. And so they had to come home um, in the middle of the night or at 2 or 3 in the morning. So these call centers are absolute theaters of neoliberal violence in the sense that do they provide for cars or you know safe transportation for the women to go home? Uh, these are their women workers? Absolutely not, because that's investing in the workforce, right? So the women are left on their own devices to figure out a way to come home at these um, uh, you know, uh, absurd hours uh, of, of the morning. Uh, they worked evening schedules. Um, it's to their low-wage precarious position on the labor market was added the risk of nighttime walks to and from work on the streets uh, of, of a uh, city with a hideous record of uh, uh, you know, safety for women, Okay, Delhi as, as, as a city. Now, remember, this is not. Uh, there is there is a further rhetoric, um, racist rhetoric to this that whenever India is at least in the United States, whenever India is in the news in the New York Times, it's always violent Indian men. Okay, so um, that 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 is is highlighted. Now, uh, the vast majority, uh, uh, one of the uh, well, not vast majority, but one of the greatest contributors to the statistics of violence that you will never hear about in, in the, in the um, Western papers are police forces. Okay, So the police are one of the most violent sources of uh, you know, uh, domestic abuse and, and uh, gender violence on the streets of Delhi. You, know, you do not, if you're a woman, walking, if woman worker uh, walking back from home, you do not ask help from, uh, uh, from a policeman to, to uh, help you back home. Just like if you're a black person or a Latina in the United States, you do not ask a cop for help because there's more chances he'll shoot you. And in the, in the Indian case, that he will assault you, then help you. Okay, but the idea that the state produces these germs and institutions of violence, you never hear in the New York Times. You only hear, you know, random Indian men attacking, attacking women. Um, in uh, Lesotho, for instance, women have been raped leaving garment factories late at night, while garment workers in Bangladesh reported that working long hours and arriving home as late as 2 a.m. can provoke the suspicion and threats by husbands and male relatives, especially when their employers hiding evidence of excessive overtime had punched their hour card to show that they had left the factory at 6 p.m. OK, so the, the boss is saying that you were not here uh, till 2 in the morning because the boss doesn't want to pay you overtime. So he has not punched your card. And then your husband is saying, where were you till 2 in the morning? The woman says, I was in the factory. But the boss says, no, she wasn't, right? although she was. And so of course, there, is, um, there are the conditions of possibility of violence. right? Where were you in the middle of the night? 
So I don't want to go, uh, for the sake of time, we can, we can talk about this other phenomenon in, uh, in, in the Q&A. But I want people to um, sort of archive in their head the, the, the phenomenon of the EPZs, okay, the export processing zone. I mean, many of you may be uh, familiar with that, okay, and how export processing zones are basically rampant theaters of gender violence, okay. The vast majority uh, of, of, of big uh, section of the workforce as female, okay, working in garment industries because women have nimble fingers apparently, so we uh, employ women, and also because women are very docile, okay? So women are docile, easier to, um, easier to command in these situations, so all your Zara and your H&M clothes are being uh, produced in these factories. So um, if you go to uh, Dhaka, uh, which is the capital of Bangladesh, you walk through the streets of Dhaka, um, there is um, the, the, the uh, number of women on the streets is uh, markedly low, okay? You're just walking around the streets of Dhaka uh, and, and you just say, where are the women? There are so few women. Get up at three in the morning, because I did, and stand at any street corner and you'll see droves of women, droves of women going to where? to work at what they call garment factory, okay? Garment factory, which are these export processing zones, okay? So these garment factories, I don't know if you know about the, uh, the famous fire that, that took place um, and at Rana Plaza, okay? So these garment factories, so I went into one to, to talk to women and interview women. So the first thing is that, you know, some German company will say, well, if you're going to employ so many women, you must have uh, childcare provisions for the woman inside the factory, okay? And the local contractor to this says, oh, yes, absolutely, we're going to have a childcare uh, whatever, right? So I was given a floor plan to see, now, so unionization is absolutely illegal here. In fact, what is so interesting is the laws of Bangladesh, the labor laws of Bangladesh do not operate on the export processing zones, okay? Because the export processing zones are, are, are separate and they are the sort of rampant theater for capital, okay? So because that's what's bringing in all the dollars and the whatever. So, so labor, ordinary labor laws of the nation do not apply to it, just the same as um, in, in Mexico. So in Mexico, the, the export processing zone is basically called the uh, murder of women capital of uh, of Mexico. Okay, so the, because the number of um, uh, assaults on women workers in these zones by managers and bosses are unbelievably high. So anyway, to go back to the story of the factory. So I go into this room where the where the um, the childcare room is supposed to be, and there's a huge transformer there. So like none of the laws are actually followed, even if they say that you know, we've got this here to the German company, there is no provision for women. So think about, uh, and these factories are not built to any kind of fire regulation. So for instance, when Rana Plaza happened, everyone burned to cinder, okay? It was Game of Thrones, like every single person burned down, okay? And most of them are women. Okay, and most of these people have had to craft together some kind of an absolutely inhuman regime of childcare in order to come and work here in these long hours, right? So, you know, from uh, three in the morning till uh, till midnight, they work here while uh, it, you know the, their children have to be taken care of in in other ways. And of course, when they're late or when something happens, they're sluts because you know they're not doing the right kind of domestic gendered expe expectations in the thing. So they're sluts at home often, but also because they're women, gender violence is a braided strain of labor discipline, okay? So rapes, searches, uh, naked body searches, humiliating searches are very, very common in all of these workplaces. Now, I just want you to imagine a society where such theaters of violence exist, okay? How is it not possible that it will percolate to the generalized section of society, okay? If that is one of the central ways in which this country is making its money or the ruling class is creating money, then how can that spirit, that, that 
that culture of um, gendered expectation and violence not spread to the, uh, to the uh, rest of the country. So one of the things that also uh, happens in these moments of you know, acute restructuring is uh, uh, traditions have to be invented. Okay, So because um, these kind of uh, regimes then need to push through and, um, and sharpen images of tr uh, some uh, you know, fabricated tradition that is about the women's the woman's expected role in, in society. In an interview with the World Bank, an Egyptian man uh, us, uh, from a small fishing village in the Nile Valley had a very materialist expectation explanation for violence against women. And I quote him, he said, the insufficiency of income is what affects the man-woman relationship. Sometimes she wakes me up in the morning asking for five pounds, and if I don't have it, I get depressed and I leave the house. And when I come back, we start to fight. Needless to say, this particular part of the Nile Valley has been fighting an acute water crisis since the involvement of the World Bank in this region. A Ghanaian man, from West Africa had an even sharper appraisal of this problem. Like, why, why is there gender violence in, in this part of Ghana? He said, it's because of unemployment and poverty that most men in this community beat their wives. We have no money to look after them. Okay, So um, in these stark and direct accounts, we face the precise moment of violence but find that we are still left with a range of questions. So, um, you know, so what is it, um, we, we know that um, social provisioning being taken away creates the conditions of violence. We know poverty and these kind of lack of infrastructure and resources are not sufficient, uh, are, are actually uh, necessary uh, um, tools that, um, when you take away, create, again, conditions for violence. But we still have to answer another fundamental question. Like, we've laid out some of this structure for why maybe violence can take place, but it does not explain why the man beats the woman, right? Because if this structure has been of violence, have have been produced, why is it that the woman is not beating the man? Because the structure is as relevant to the man as it is to the woman, right? So the fact that these things are taken away is affects the woman as much as the man. So why is it that when the man comes home from work and doesn't find the food, he hits the woman, not the other way around? Because the woman is also coming home tired from work. So why doesn't she hit the man, right? So, so those kind of questions we still uh, need uh, to uh, answer. So there are no real rationales for why gendered violence take place, right? In the sense that you cannot really rationally explain why I need to hit you, OK? But we can have. That does not mean that there is no reason. I'm simply saying that there is no rational except that it's a violent mode of control, right? So, um, but the, uh, as human beings, we have to be able to rationalize it for ourselves, at least minimally, as a form of regrettable but meaningful action. Capitalist ideology seeks to provide meaning to such violent actions in two basic ways. One is through the deeply rooted sexist idea of the gender division of labor within the family. Despite the fact that in the vast majority of households, both men and women have to work for pay outside the home, there is a sexist expectation that it is women who will take care of the home. Okay, the reasons uh, for this uh, are, are manifold, and we can discuss them later. That, uh, but it is for our argument. It is important to note that, according to this particular aspect of sexism, it is women who are expected to be responsible for providing for the family within the home, and hence also responsible for any lack of provisioning, right? So since the gender division of labor, you are, I am responsible for work, and you are responsible for home, that sexist division of labor still exists. Whatever is lacking in the home, then is your problem. It is because of you that there is a lack in the home. So there is no uh, understanding that the reason 
there is no food or there's no water is because of this wider context of deracination of social provisioning. It is because care has been pushed so much into the home that it's the women's responsibility. So if there isn't a hot meal, then it's your fault that there isn't a hot meal or there isn't clean, uh, clean water. So, um, and these existing sexist ideas try to legitimize themselves through an appeal to tradition. Okay, that this is the tradition in this, and in a way, this is an old capitalist trick. You know, all of these kind of um, divisions uh, are are explained by an appeal to tradition, whether it's a nation or or the the family. Okay, so um, we want to say. Um, here that um, uh, a study published in the uh, British Medical Journal in 2012 found that across Europe, suicide rates rose sharply from 2008 uh, to nine as the financial crisis drove unemployment up and squeezed incomes. So, um, so um, the, uh, in, in countries that were most affected by the uh, financial crisis, like Greece and Ireland, the suicide rates were really, really high. And um, it was, and in all of these countries, it was found that men were found to be three times more likely to commit suicide than women, um, resulting in the study's conclusion that, and I quote, much of men's identity and sense of purpose is tied up with having a job. It brings income, status, importance, okay? Uh, in 2011, Time magazine echoed this view, and I'm quoting, with men culturally shouldering the role of primary breadwinner for their um, families uh, is an important factor in depression risk um, uh, for, for men. So culturally shouldering is a key term. Because materially, women and men both work now increasingly all over the world. And actually, if you think of particular groups of women, I mean, you know, for instance, black women, they have always worked in, in the United States, okay? So, so the fact that women have been homemakers have been only true for a very limited period in capitalism's history, and that too for a very limited group of women, okay? So in the vast periods of human history, uh, or capitalist history, women and men have both worked, and yet, this gendered stereotype exists that men are the breadwinners and women are the homemakers. And in fact, after the crash of uh, 2008, this was, um, I, I don't know uh, how old you all were in 2008, but I was driving to work on, uh, one day in, and I heard this um, uh, advert on the radio uh, from um, uh, from an insurance company in 2009. This is right after the crash, right? So it's an insurance company, and it said, if you are a man and you feel unable to provide for your family, this is the right insurance for you. Regain your status as the provider for your family. So this was like a major insurance company coming on radio telling you this. No wonder men were feeling that they had basically lost their place in society, and they were, you know, fa they were failures, as it were. So this, um, this spurious, which is absolutely untrue, division of the male breadwinner and the female homemaker is sustained and resuscitated by capitalism in periods of uh, crisis in order to um, explain uh, the the situation. But actually. Um, in the, in, in the United States, for instance, it is so ridiculous because uh, increasingly both men and women work uh, paid labor to maintain a, a household, and both men and women work at home unpaid labor to take care of their families, okay? Yes, in the United States, men perform nine hours less uh, uh, domestic labor than women, but men still do a lot of domestic labor because they have to, because the situation is such that because the, the wage is so low that both men and women have to work. And so there is nothing, there is no choice but the men to do it, uh, to do work in, in the house. But, um, uh, but that, that idea is never goes into the production of masculinity that the man is taking care of the child at home, but always into the production of uh, femininity. 
So um, uh, let us now, if we look at the, uh, one of the scholars, um, uh, Joan Williams, uh, has written this really important uh, book. And she observes uh, about the working class family. And she makes an important observation um, about working class masculinity. And she says that um, gender acts as an important uh, hidden injury of class reflected in the sense of inadequacy that stems from working class men's ever increasing inability to perform as breadwinners. Um, and William says that, uh, you know, for two brief generations after World War II, the separate sphere ideal was democratized. But today, the ability to achieve the breadwinner ideal is once again tied to class privilege, OK? Because breadwinner homemaker families have signaled middle class status since the 1780s, successful performance of these roles is seen as vital amongst working class families. So in, in the sense, this model of the breadwinner and homemaker is actually a middle class, upper class ideal. Okay, This has never been true for working class families. But because it is an upper class, middle class ideal, it is an aspirational model. right? So you can say, as a working class man, I don't allow my wife to go to work. Okay? So in order to meet that, working, uh, that aspirational model. Um, so the, um, the, the traditional breadwinner homemaker role and the gender expectations that flow from it was never a working class tradition to begin with, but was loaned. This model was loaned to the working class by capital. The power of this model lies precisely in its ability to erase actually existing class differences by presenting an universal brotherhood of all men. And it divides the working class along gender lines by imputing unrealistic gender expectations on both men and women, which by necessity will always fail in reality. So let us now let, take a second look at our cardboard figure, the model wife and her model family. Whether she's pulling off a perfect dinner in New York or New Delhi is, in fact, a class warrior. Her ideal family is preserved in the timeless amber of capital's glory days, where men will always be men, labor unions will always be unheard of, and slaves and lower classes will always bring home uh, the cotton. So this, this model is actually a class model that capital mobilizes in order to uh, mute down class uh, uh, antagonism. So. Um, the gender, then, is an important ideological weapon used to hide the fault lines of class. The rising tide of rape defense from figures of social standing, the spate of bills attacking reproductive and LGBTQ rights, slut shaming, uh, uh, attacks on trans people, uh, as you know, Trump is leading on that, are various ways to reorder femininity and re-invoke the mythic breadwinner, homemaker, family, or heteronormativity, thus providing a ballast to unrealistic gender expectations and models for working class men and, and women. So the reinvention of the ideal family and the family values is actually helpful in, in the period of capitalist crisis. I don't know if you've seen the news. Uh, a, Amer a state in America has just made abortion entirely uh, illegal. Okay, So this is, again, a family value that we are being told. So this family value is something that we need to win the working classes to in order to um, create a, 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 a meaningful class solidarity between the lawmakers who are the ruling class men and working class uh, men. And, and, and so on. So uh, we, uh, I mean, where do we go from here? Uh, a key to neoliberalism's triumph always was and remains today a successful and highly gendered attack on the global working class. Okay, So this, uh, we can never see uh, this as only a sort of, in, you know, uh, the, the attack on the working class is not just in class terms. It has this you know, uniquely 
gendered uh, uh, um, aspect uh, to it. So, um, I mean, one of the um, things that, uh, you know, just to, just to sum up, uh, one of the leading um, uh, movements against gender violence in recent times, as you all know, is Me Too, right? But Me Too is not, does not just reveal for us. Me Too does not just reveal for us the nature of violence between a, a man and a woman. Me Too, one of the things that it reveals for us is the dictatorial nature of the workplace. Okay, because all of these men who have been, so what is the, what is the driver of violence in these situations has been the ultimate power the man has had over the particular individual woman, either as a boss in, in, in a workplace, such as Harvey Weinstein, or as a professor at a university over a young student. So it is this sort of relationship of dominance within the workplace with the woman having no um, uh, uh, recourse to, um, to, uh, uh, to a collective way um, into how, um, uh, how to, how to uh, fight back. So any discussion of Me Too, uh, must acknowledge the fact that the deeply autobiographical testimonies of sexual violence by women actually trace the biography of something else, the workplace. Nested within the accounts of personal violations lies yet another secret, the stunningly dictatorial nature of the workplace that is perhaps for the first time being discussed openly. Me Too shows the normative nature of the boss's control over workers' lives, reproducing used each day through the power he holds over employment and enforced each day through intimidation, bullying, and outright uh, violence. So each of these bosses that were toppled, you know, Harvey Weinstein, uh, Roger Alias, the co-creator of uh, Fox News, were also um, definitely about, um, you know, uh, were workplace <laughs> situations uh, um, in, in these. So, but a significant amount of women both in the US where Me Too uh, began, but everywhere else, actually work under multiple bosses or authorities who have control over their ability to work and hence live. State agencies such as the Office of um, Immigration sometimes provide the legal context for the illegal sexual assault by workplace boss. So, um, you know, um, the, if, you, if you speak out in the workplace, you will be deported. Okay, so this is why women often remain silent, because the wage still remains the only way that the woman have access to resources for her life. Okay, because and in increasingly uh, the wage is connected to health care, the wage is connected to benefits. So if you lose the wage, if you lose the job, you lose the means to all those ingredients of social reproduction that you need to live and for your family to live. Okay, so the wage then becomes this tyrannical uh, uh, institution in the woman's life, and whatever happens within the workplace, then ha there is an enforced silence on the woman uh, because uh, uh, of um, in order to hold on uh, to to the job. Um, so one of the things that we want to um, think about at the end that um, what then is. Um, uh, is it just the fear of being fired that maintains this elaborate architecture of silence around uh, workplace assault? But um, it is not just, you know, um, uh, so in other words, um, um, if we see the workplace as the only disciplining space for women, then we miss the material relations that bind the place of work to the spaces of home and life. We thus miss the fears that resol and resolves that arise out of this uh, mutuality. What women urgently need to speak out against their abuser is security in the most expansive and socialized sense, not just security at work, 
against possible retaliation, but also the security of a robust infrastructure of social services that will catch her if she does get fired, tide her over, and sustain her family till the next job. While the first can be attained through unionization, the latter needs much wider society-wide, often anti-systemic struggles. A traditional union, labor union, draws its boundaries of authority at the doors of the workplace. But what good is a union contract for a survivor of sexual assault if the immigration authorities raid her home and threatens deportation? A fighting union thus must unite the struggles at the point of production with the wider social inequality which produces such struggle. A woman does not struggle for higher wage for the sake of the wage. She fights in order to afford a better life for herself and her family. Similarly, the union cannot simply fight for her job security in the face of harassment, battles that ensure the reproduction of life, the struggle for universal health care, free education, or public transit, need to be led by unions if they want to be trusted in the workplace, for it is these social conditions that allow women to speak out against individual har harassers. Okay, So I want to uh, end with uh, the question of, uh, you know, what do we do with the abuser? Because this brings us to the fundamental problem of the dilemma that capitalism uh, produces for us. Okay, So on the one hand, we want punishment for the abuser. Okay, Once a, Because as we all know, that the rate of conviction is abysmally low right, for all uh, cases of uh, sexual assault. So we do want conviction for the abuser. But on the other hand, what does a conviction actually mean? And this is where we go back to the car parcel functions of the state. right? A conviction then means that we are asking for an enhancement of the carceral functions of the capitalist state. So if you look at two different kinds of movements right now in the United States, you see the capitalist uh, juridical contradiction come to a head. On the one hand, you have me Two, which is drawing attention to sexual violence, which is asking for abusers to be brought to justice. On the other hand, you have Black Lives Matter, which is talking about how the state functions in deeply racialized ways to incarcerate men of color. Okay, So both of these avenues are, so capitalism gives us the rock and the hard place, right? On the one hand, it creates the conditions for gender violence, and the only solution it offers is in the arms of the capitalist state, okay? So this is something that I think as, um, as feminists and Marxist feminists, we have to think about and think through um, how uh, we uh, think about the solutions to, to gender violence. Under the current justice system, perhaps, capitalism will always force our approach to the individual abuser to hover between doubt and irresolution, OK? That we, we are never sure whether we really want the police state to enhance its power, but on the other hand, do we really want the rapist to go free? OK, so this doubt and irresolution will perhaps always be with us under capitalism because the way the system sets itself up. If futures are imminent in the present, then perhaps an abolitionist feminism is still only accumulating its form from the floating heterotopias of our time. However, till such a feminism breeds life, we can resolve at least this that while the question of forgiveness for the individual abuser can be reflected upon, restorative justice can be reflected upon, the system that produced him, that protected him, and that enabled him can never be forgiven. Thank you. Maybe we can take some uh, questions from the audience. Maybe I can start with one. Yes. I mean, um, we spoke yesterday in an interview about uh, transphobia. Um, and you addressed some of uh, these questions. But it seems, it seems important to address it uh, now also, the question of instrumentalization of genders, uh, non-biological functions in capitalism. So maybe you can comment on that. 
Okay, so um, I think this is about two things. One is um, the absolute centrality of heteronormative um, family unit to capital, right? So this has been capital's go-to uh, through its inception, that the heteronormative family, the father and the mother producing the baby, uh, again, to go back to the questions of the breadwinner, the homemaker, this model has served capital well, okay? This model came under challenge by actually uh, our queer comrades and gender um, uh, non-normative uh, gender comrades through social movements, right? That this was, this is the, and it exposed uh, for the first time uh, something that uh, women and queer folks have known all along, which is the dictatorial nature of the family and the, and the family, uh, heteronormative family structure. So uh, this, but the fact remains that this structure, because of its historical tenacity and its historical record, is still capital's go-to model whenever it is, uh, it is in crisis. So all the stories, all the fables, everything is, is woven around this. In fact, you know, um, if you look at you know, some of the work that um, uh, queer scholars are, are uh, working on right now is queer scholars are trying to talk about homonormativity. And by homonormativity, they simply mean where uh, queer, uh, queer uh, people were seen as the deviants, okay? So they were seen as, the, they, the, the, the movement began its life as a radical critique of the bourgeois family, of the heteronormative family, right? But throughout the period of capitalism's incorporation, you now have a homonormative family, um, which is, uh, you know, gay people getting married in these elaborate ceremonies, etc. So queer scholars have criticized, uh, not criticized gay marriage, but have criticized um, the homonormativity that capitalism has now produced in order to maintain the family unit, even if it's not a, a male. Um, and a female, but a queer couple in the same kind of homo uh, heteronormative structure. So only it is a, a queer couple. Now, in recent times, thankfully, the trans movement has actually thrown in another very, very significant challenge to homonormativity, okay? And this is why capital uh, and this question of a settled identity of maleness or femaleness, right? So uh, this is a much more profound challenge uh, than capital has faced in recent times, okay? It's a pretty profound challenge because even in older Marxist traditions, uh, uh, Marxists were um, uh, taught to uh, uh, to understand that there was uh, sex was stable and gender was social. Okay, so that's the way older Marxists have kind of understood the sex gender um, question. But I think uh, queer scholars and especially trans movement, uh, the, the social movements of trans people have completely destabilized this idea and have shown how sex and gender are actually on a continuum and you can actually, uh, the fact that you think that this is sex is also because of a certain kind of socialization, that you recognize certain physical uh, qualities coming together as the male sex is also a matter of historical uh, training, as it were, right? So, and, and the, the whole idea of the gender binary, that there's always ma men and women, is actually historically, uh, queer scholars are now showing, uh, are, are, have never been true, uh, as it were. There's always been uh, people and, and communities that, that go in between and, and disturb both of those binaries. So this is a real problem for capital. Okay, this is a real problem for capital because, oh my God, here again is another challenge to heteronormativity. So capital is trying, I mean, in every single 
uh, country of the global north, you will see that the violence against trans communities is escalating, OK? So um, one in three trans people are likely to be homeless in the United States. This is the heart of capital, one of the most prosperous countries of the world, OK? The escalation of violence, just sheer physical violence against uh, trans people is, is unbelievable in, in the United States and, and the UK. In the UK, a Tory government, you know, not known for their feminism, is trying to pass the Gender Recognition Act, and you have the entire society up in arms, as if uh, trans people should not be able to determine, uh, you know, who they want to be. I mean, this should be something that medically determines, and on the uh, by some doctor or some state authority. So. So this is a very important challenge to heteronormativity. And as feminists, and especially as Marxists, I think we should do everything we can to give that one push to heteronormativity with our trans comrades, right? Because if this is a lever that we use to break up the bloody family, then we should use it. <laughs> OK, now we have hands. Uh, Lina and then Mislav. OK, uh, related to what uh, also Karolina asked, like from the queer perspective, um, also what you were uh, like, uh, saying about um, the uh, queer theoretics, uh, I wanted to ask about what do you think about the perspective uh, of abolition, like criticism of uh, abstract labor? Because of abstract labor, labor, ah. like wage labor. Because, for example, uh, already in the 70s, queer Marxists criticized like labor because labor makes them like to, to Maybe fit in just certain a bit louder. Yeah, like <laughs> labor, it's what uh, forces queer people to fit in certain categories, like adapt to their sexual behavior, like their gender performance, and also like their um, let's say reproductive labor, even though this term was not used at the time. So, yeah, they were just criticizing not just what they have to do at home and stuff like this, but also just the fact that they have to work for a wage uh, and discipline themselves and their emotions, uh, sexuality, etc., in order to be like, able to work. So, how do you, do you think it's, if it's important from like feminist perspective of today also to like consider this the theories of abolition of labor and this. Are you asking me sort of like the kind of um, the Kathy um, uh, Weeks like book about like should we abolish labor? Is 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 that the question? And whether if if that's the question, I'm all for abolishing wage labor. Yeah, that's the whole point why I'm a Marxist. That wage labor creates um, you know conditions of uh, absolute tyranny for not just queer people. I mean, think about it. I mean, for women, queer people, but also think about disabled people, right? So uh, the the whole question of ability is shaped by how able you are to produce for capital. So yes, if we are talking about abolishing wage labor, yes, I'm all for it. That's why I'm a Marxist. But I think if you're asking the question of whether this is specifically um, uh, detrimental to certain groups of workers than others, then yes, I also agree with that. So this is part of, I think, what um, I, the, the work of social reproduction theory tries to do, which is, um, I think one of the th um, insights from it is that the working class is reproduced or socially reproduced at different levels of abjection, right? So it is because certain neighborhoods and certain communities have access to certain kind of resources, they have better uh, life chances, as it were, in the world. So I mean, if you apply that to sort of uh, you know gender non-normative um, uh, how uh, workers and, and so on, then it's equally true that the, the social reproduction of abjection is very different from, let's say, a white, able-bodied, cisgendered man. But the question then is not simply of whether these differences exist and whether wage labor is more uh, detrimental to uh, uh, queer people and, you know, 
people of color. There is undoubtedly true. The question is, what do we do about it? So either we can take one line of argument that since this level of particular harm and abjection can only be understood by those of us who experience it, then this struggle is ours, OK, alone. But the other understanding is that because, as you correctly say, that it is wage labor, the relationship between wage labor and capital, that creates the conditions for all of these objections, then the white, cis, able-bodied man have as much to win from joining my struggle as I do joining his, right? So in that sense, I always see a social reproduction theory as a theorization of solidarity. That if solidarity were to develop a theory, that would be social reproduction theory. And so that is, you know, I think my understanding of how we understand differential objections, but most importantly, how to get rid of it. Just to talk also a little bit like an answer to your question, like whether, like how do we deal with uh, the fact that the state is disciplining um, the worker class by, yeah, just. Um, uh, individual, individualizing those rapists just in the working class and also incarcerating them. And I, it seems to me that the answer is, I mean, an utopistic answer that those rapists, even though you know, it's not that I, like, um, I'm saying, um, ident identify with that, but yeah, this is like the working class, and I think that maybe the answer is, like that, as you all just said, that when, I mean, uh, women and men should just join together to fight labor and I agree with you and and this is this is my position but it still leaves me so I am curious to hear what you think because uh, how do we deal with a rapist because this is you know um, a lot of black feminists in the US are experimenting with and thinking through questions of restorative justice okay and the reason that they are in a good position to talk about this is because they do prison work. Okay, so once you, um, you know, do work within these. Uh, so as you know, the uh, U.S. has the highest incarceration rates uh, in, in the planet, and most of them are black men, right? So once you do work in the prisons, you understand the life stories of the men. Again, you understand the context in which they committed these acts of violence, right? And then we can begin to have a conversation about reintegration, restorative justice, and, and so on. But it is not, there are no pat answers, right? Because as I said, there is one uh, problem, which is conviction rates are so low. And on the other, incarceration rates, you know, in general, in a racialized way, are so high. So to be able to meet these two movements is a very, very difficult situation till we build, um, you know, better conditions to ameliorate the conditions that produce violence rather than the individual act of violence itself. Isla? I mean, there are really uh, many places that uh, from the lecture that we can comment on, maybe ask a question, but I would like to uh, maybe return to the, to the image uh, just at the end when you were talking about um, how, how basically the whole Red Miller uh, uh, image is being uh, pushed down from the, from the middle classes or the upper classes of the society down towards the, the, the working class. And uh, this really made me think, because uh, of course it is... Uh, it is. Uh, it should be some. Some of you that you are approaching it from this uh, Marxist uh, um, uh, perspective, and uh, that uh, the whole uh, the, the, your whole lecture is basically uh, um, presented from this uh, um, uh, understanding of the violence through through the through the lens of the societies, um, um, uh, the way the society works within the capitalist framework. So, uh, but uh, what made me think is basically the. That uh, uh, there is always this uh, this um, issue, uh, especially on the, in the feminist uh, you know discussions and so on, uh, specifically about the violence as uh, some as you also mentioned at the, at the beginning as this uh, 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 individual uh, uh, yeah interpersonal um, event you know between two persons or whatever, 
And uh, it seems to me that uh, after you presented this this image, that uh, it's um, uh, if you could comment uh, uh, if there is this uh, in this uh, understanding whether it's uh, only based on the gender, you know, uh, divide or on the class divide. Maybe you can make uh, a bit um, expand on this because uh, for me it seems that, um, uh, that there is uh, uh, it it would be somewhat. Uh, not really, um, you couldn't really uh, expect for the society on the level of, uh, of um, the family to work any different than what you are, you are describing, for example, in the factory or in general, you know, uh, as a capital society, simply a class society. And then you will expect to see some form of, you know, class, so, some of class division even within, uh, the, even within uh, the family, uh, which you then see as a as a gender division. So, it's a, can you maybe uh, uh, expand on this? Always, you know, critical question: whether it's just you know gender, you know, uh, issue, or is it uh, maybe more of a class issue? You know? I'm not entirely sure I understood your question, uh, but can I? rephrase it then see if I understood it okay so are you saying that it seemed from my talk that class has a lot of uh, class has something to do with gender violence but feminists often produce uh, portray gender violence as an interpersonal issue alone so do I think it is class, or do I think it's gender? Is that your question? Maybe more if uh, we need to return more to the class, because this is something that ah. uh, has been missing from the conversation for a long time now. Uh, at least up until really recently with your book and so on. Well, thank you for saying that. But, uh, you know, <laughs> I, I think, though, um, I think, um, Okay, let me, let me think about this a little more because I want to draw um, from resources that uh, I did not get a chance to, th think of, uh, to talk about. So, yes, I do think that uh, in certain feminist discourse, the focus has been on interpersonal uh, relationships. And that has been the case of a lot of liberal feminist discourse throughout the history of capitalism, okay? So 19th century, 20th century, there've always been this branch of feminism that uh, that has seen men as the problem, right? Or, uh, and uh, it is men and men, male violence and, and various strands of that has, um, has been given a sort of scientific uh, uh, um, glamour to it, like, you know, men's brains are different, men are, you know, going hard getting, they're blah, blah. So uh, there is a really nice book called The Testosterone and Rex, okay, uh, which is, which um, actually dismantles all these uh, scientific claims of men being different from women, right? So there has always been this strand of bourgeois um, uh, myth making that sees the problem in the individual or in this case in males in general okay and I think it's not just Marxist or socialist feminists who have emphasized the conditions of possibility for these things and in rooted in larger structures of um, capitalist institutions such as family the gender division of labor and so on I think actually a lot of um, in, in general feminist discourse, this has also been very much a practice, if not theorized, right? So, I mean, throughout the 1960s and 70s, um, uh, you've had uh, feminist uh, movements in which perhaps this was not theorized as such, but it was certainly practice where feminists were demanding more for, you know, hospitals and healthcare and abortion rights, you know, 
intuitively understanding that these larger structures actually create conditions of harm reduction for all women and including men. Okay, So the movement has intuitively often worked in this manner, if not fully theorized, uh, uh, theorized this. This, the same for if you think about women's roles in anti-colonial struggles, uh, some, something that I study uh, in my other life, which is you know throughout the um, throughout the period of uh, anti-British uh, uh, um, movements, uh, the British uh, anti-imperialist movements in India. Uh, the the women uh, movement of the anti-imperialist movement have always demanded social provisioning. This was like a big demand of women's movements in the uh, early 20th century because they said that it is the lack of these uh, social provisioning that creates danger for our women and children in the villages. Okay, so we need more hospitals, we need more schools. So again, I think there's been an intuitive acknowledgement of the uh, structures within the movement, but perhaps the theorization is um, uh, is is something that we are revisiting. And you know, although I'm heavily flattered and and thank you for saying that my book is drawing attention to it, but this is this has been part of Marxist feminist uh, you know theorization throughout the uh, uh, 20th century, right? The the question of gender division of labor, etc. What is so amazing is that a Marxist feminism is having a comeback in our moment of neoliberal crisis where we urgently need it the most. And that's, I think, one of the most hopeful things that these uh, categories of analysis are starting to make sense again for a new generation of feminist activists. And that's where I think our resources for hope lies. Yes? I have a question regarding the gender expectations you were talking about. It seems to me that in recent times the expectations are shifting a bit, or at least they are contested by um, recent events. And it seems to me that we are moving from the gender expectation of men being the only or being the breadwinners in the family as more women are joining the workforce. And as that, as, as and as you have said, uh, men are engaging more in um, housework. So my question lies, uh, where is the problem in, uh, why don't we see the solidarity between men and women on this gender and class intersection in the working class families, where men are simply oblivious to the fact, I suppose, that uh, the system is putting both men and women down and that they're both, if they're in a family, that they're both against it rather than, you know, um, the system is against me and I have to vent my anger on someone else rather than it being a solidarity fight against the system and saying, uh, you know, both me and you are having it hard and we should, you know, try to put through this together. Or is it maybe a naive? No, no, it's a great question. It's a great question that all of us are trying to resolve, right? I mean, this is why we are in these uh, rooms late at night having these discussions. Why doesn't the bloody working class rise up and smash capitalism? OK, what's keeping them? So I mean, to, to take your question um, seriously, I think, I mean, it's not just uh, in, let me, let me revisit the question and rephrase it in a certain way. When are the moments when, the, when we do see moments of solidarity? Let's think about that. Because it's not that those moments of solidarity have never existed in the history of capitalism, OK? So let's think about what, in what periods of capital's history have we witnessed this incredible solidarity between men and women saying, you know, the system sucks and we must fight it together. And those are moments of mass struggle. Okay, either during strikes, uh, either during or during mass movements. Okay, those are the moments of um, incredible, intense uh, uh, solidarity uh, that we we witness where 
these kind of uh, models that capital sells us is unlearned and sometimes unlearned rapidly uh, overnight, okay? Because, because struggle is such a school that uh, in order to survive the boss's attack, in order for the strike to win, in order for the strike to spread, you have to be solarizing with your fellow you know, women workers or you have to be solarizing with the rest, rest of the community. So it is in those moments of struggle that we find that um, human beings and, and workers overcome these sort of muck of ages, as, as Marx called it, of sexism and racism. And it is through, uh, it is a sort of struggle that kind of then makes them fit to rule, as it were. So, so the question is not so much why the, the working class, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, does not rise up because as we as we know from Marx that the uh, the the ruling classes ideas are the ruling ideas of our time so we all you know subscribe to a certain extent to those ideas you know I like to uh, look pretty I like to wear uh, you know earrings etc these are absurd things you know uh, that that we pick up from capital telling us what to do, et cetera. But those are not the important things. The important things are where, in what conjunctures are those models challenged collectively? And in what junctures have those models become rickety? Okay, And those junctures are always junctures of mass struggle. So we, I think we should ask, re-ask the question that, um, uh, re-answer the question by saying, what can what are the resources that are necessary for mass struggles to take off because those are the moments in which i think gender and racial models will be best challenged or hopefully even dismantled maybe you can broaden this with the question of alliances on the burning issues which question of alliance uh, well the uh, how we make alliances today as a, as a feminist, <coughs> as a Marxist, as a socialist, on the burning issues. Be because obviously it's, a, it's a still a fragmented struggle and uh, we don't have not even infrastructure, we don't have any political power, not enough at least. Hmm. So with whom and where are the borders? Ah, with whom? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Okay. Um, okay. This is a very general question. So I'm going to try. So I need input from you as to what kind of struggles you are involved in, so that we can have a fuller discussion here. So one. Um, so I can answer. Um, oh, this is being recorded. So um, I have to. I have to tell you some secrets. But uh, since it's being recorded, they won't remain secrets anyway. So this is about organizing with liberal feminists. Um, uh, for the international uh, women's strike in 2017, okay? So I don't know if you know about the Women's March in on Washington, D.C. in January of 2017, okay? So it was one of the largest uh, uh, um, mobilization in the history of the United States, okay? Um, so millions uh, marched against Trump, okay? And many, many of those uh, people who, who march, it was those uh, pussy hats. Remember those pink hats that people wore? Those very annoying, but people wore them because they saw it as a, uh, as, as a symbol of, of resistance or whatever, OK? Anyhow, uh, yes, I, I know. We would not be caught dead wearing a pink pussy hat, but there you have it, OK? So that, the, the leadership of that movement was liberal. And the leadership of that movement was heavily uh, uh, aligned to the Democratic Party. In fact, it is because they were so heavily aligned with the Democratic Party that after that first success of 2017, they turned the entire movement onto an electoral campaign for Democrats, okay? That they no longer focused on the streets. It was all about let's get more Democrat, female Democrats elected, okay? These are female Democrats who for years and years have actually reneged on Roe v. Wade, okay? So even Planned Parenthood, which is one of the Democratic Party's uh, you know, uh, providers, Planned Parenthood 
this is the sole abortion, one of the sole abortion providers in a country of 300 million people, okay? The only institution, okay? And their language on abortion is something that's gonna make you cry. Their language on abortion is uh, Planned Parenthood provides services for women and also provides abortion. Like it is an apology, okay? It's like, it's this one shameful thing we do, which we are really ashamed of, but we do it, okay? There is no direct confrontation free abortion without apology on demand. I don't care why you're seeking an abortion. You're a grown woman. If you're seeking an abortion, you have the right to an abortion, okay? So this rhetoric has been abundant by Democrats for years, and now we have this, um, this calamity of the Republicans. So these were the kind of people that uh, uh, my colleagues and I on the international women's strike, Chinsia, one of them, uh, we had to deal with in, 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 um, in trying to organize the strike. And the women's, one of the women's march leaders, um, and this is like the choicest coat, uh, we were on a conference call trying to decide on the strike, you know, how to build uh, in various little towns and so on. So this uh, person said, so this Women's March um, leader said to me, um, you know, I still have a real problem with the word strike. And I said, okay, tell me why. And she said, okay, look, the Democratic Party has abandoned us. And I said, yes, that's great. You know, she's becoming critical of the Democrats and so on. This is fantastic. We are making headway. She said, this is why capital is our friend and our ally because the Democrats have abandoned us. So businesses are our friend. If we attack businesses, then we are doomed. So there are two strands. There's the political establishment, and then there's the business establishment. If the business establishment has, uh, if the political establishment has, uh, has failed us, we must turn to business. And I was like, okay, I have to deal with this now? You know, that I have to explain to her why we are anti-business and the strike is an effective weapon? So, so the question is then, what do we do? So my first instinct was, uh, have, you no, have, have you no idea? This is the international women's strike. We want to burn down the businesses rather than, you know, just uh, do anything. Okay, so the, the discussion we had was, this is an, an organization which had managed to draw in millions of people on the march, okay? So if we, how is it, how can we, we don't care about the leaders. What we want to do is carry our message of feminism for the 99%, off the strike to the constituents who they have drawn. Okay, so we would have to, now we can do it in two ways. One was our, uh, one decision could have been that we water down our message in order to work with them. Now that is a disaster wrapped in a box, okay? So you do not water down your politics in order to meet the politics of the capitalist uh, order, okay, the bourgeois norms. The other was that we say, okay, we have, these are our principles, these are our whatever, you know, can we work together focusing on these uh, specific issues, okay? So, and, and there was a lot of negotiations on that and as to how we would move forward, but we basically insisted that there were certain lines that we absolutely wouldn't cross, okay? Which was, one was, you know, this question of the strike, one was the question of Palestine, you know, those were not uh, flags that we are willing to uh, to put down, and so that was an interesting conversation of working with a liberal organization. But I think two mistakes that we often, I certainly uh, could have seen myself make as well, which is a sort of quick ultra left rejection of the entire apparatus that these bourgeois organizations have, which I think would not have been helpful at the time, okay? And the other is, you know, assimilation into their kind of politics. So I think for us, we have to have a very collective discussion as a left about strategy in these situations, especially since now there is a rise of a social democratic current in many parts of, of the globe, that we must, we cannot start with, oh, these people killed Rosa Luxemburg, they are 
our enemies, and we cannot start with, oh, we must uh, elect more and more social democratic MPs, okay? So there is a middle, uh, not a middle road, but there is a way to um, bring in revolutionary horizons into our strategic discussions, which I think have been lacking mainly because the left has been so isolated and so small for so long. And I think it's, it should be a matter of rejoicing that there is a reformist current on the rise right now, OK? Because for, uh, for the left to swim, for the revolutionary left current to swim and grow is good in reformist waters rather than there being no reformist current at all, OK? We sharpen our politics. We draw um, our, uh, um, you know, we draw the, uh, working class communities uh, uh, attracted to reformism by the sharpness of our politics. So it's a great thing to engage with it, but we must have a broader strategic discussion on how to do that. Any more questions? Ankita. No, call for the abolition of the, um, no, of the family no. and wage labor. <laughs> and then we can close. <laughs> no, that's the point I wanted to ask. Yeah. Well, first of all, I, I really have to thank you. I think that uh, your um, Marxist feminist approach to gender violence is an assassin. And uh, this, this position that, that, that you try to include the context and to try to give an answer to such an, an ungrateful question, why is this happening, is extraordinary, and I think really important. Um, usually, you know, that the, the, the most easiest way to deal with, with the problems of, of gender uh, violence, especially when you want to uh, like, explain it, is, is basically this description. It, it happens, it's there, and we need somehow to find out what, what to do, how to survive in those conditions. And when you ask why is this happening, the problems start. So really thank you for the explanation. I think it's really important, especially uh, 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 giving us an opportunity to think outside just the interpersonal uh, uh, context. Because if we just stick there, it might go to the direction that ontology is the answer, that the, that the nature and the transhistorical reasons are there. So that might be really dangerous, especially in times when we need to, to, to strike, when we need to, to deal with it. So my question was, my question is, you mentioned that, that the historical perspective of uh, the gender division of labor in families, in capitalism is really important. So how can we describe uh, this kind of differences between social reproduction feudalism or modes of production before capitalism and why can we say that there is no trans-historical reason for gender oppression? Why is it happening in capitalism? If your words. <laughs> um, well, it, it, there is a, there is a two-word answer to your question, which is class society. But um, I'm not sure you, uh, what is the reason for gender under uh, gender oppression under capitalism? Was that the question? You know, the, the, the usually the explanation of, of gender oppression is a bit transhistorical. It's always there. In, ah, in okay. slave societies, okay. in feudalism, sure, sure. ergo there is also in capitalism. Sure. But we do need somehow to historicize it. I okay. see, okay. okay. There I are see. some yeah. differences. It's yeah. not there just for the reason, not to mention because of the ontology or nature. Right. But something else is there. Right. So, I mean, uh, well, first of all, we have to um, state very clearly that uh, gender oppression does not start with capitalism. So there is a uh, there is a commonality to uh, the, the very phenomenon of uh, gender violence uh, or gender oppression in uh, other modes of production before, before capitalism. But as Ankita says, that the reasons for it are very specific to those uh, modes of production. So the reasons for gender violence or the reasons for uh, how the family unit operates 
um, within uh, uh, social relations is very specific to each of those uh, uh, modes of production. So for, un under for example, under feudalism, direct control over the woman is um, uh, over labor. So the family is a unit of production under feudalism. Okay, Under uh, capitalism, the family is not a uh, unit of production. It is evacuated of all productive uh, functions. So the way gender, viol uh, gender oppression, rather, not gender violence, the way gender violence works, uh, or why it works, and the role that the family and division of labor plays is, is different. And so for capitalism, I think one of the most amazing things about capitalism as a system is its agility and its ability to draw from uh, the past in order to repurpose it and serve its uh, its. Uh, purposes for the present, right? So some of these images and languages, like for instance, honor and tradition, are clearly languages and tropes borrowed from a, a pre-capitalist past, right? Because those those have that. But we would be uh, very silly to think that just because the form or the language is something from the past, that the work it's doing is the same. So it is serving an entirely different function under capitalism, and it's doing very different kinds of work. So I think being attentive to historical specificity is very, very important, as you point out, in, in the context of understanding. Now, um, the, the real question then becomes is, uh, was, so see, the, the problem is not so much the gender division of labor. Because, you know, uh, the, the um, OK, the, the, I'm tired now. The, her uh, name is escaping me, the, the North American anthropologist. Um, the myth of male dominance? It, Leacock. Yeah, Leacock. OK, so and Leacock's work shows that gender division of labor can exist without one gendered work being inferior to the other. OK, so just because there is a division of labor does not mean that it is uh, by nature exploitative or oppressive, right? So then we don't look at the actual practices, like who does what work, but we look at the social relations that attribute power to these practices, OK? So that's how you have to look outside and be, be particularly specific. So. Thank you all for coming. Uh, thank you, Titi, for a great lecture and fruitful discussion. Thank you very much.